meeting is being recorded. Okay, so welcome everybody to the seminar today, and it's uh, probably will be uh, uh, the last seminar of our of our for, for some time <laughs> unless we restart some some other point. And today it is a very fitting topic because the whole seminar series started with the uh, honor David Gross, and we had a conference in his honor. That's how we started the seminar series. So. And today, Paul is going to tell us about his new, new way to uh, uh, his new understanding of this uh, asymptotic freedom, and uh, in the context of scalar field theories, and uh, and this context, and how it can uh, also fit in with the standard model. So it's quite exciting. So over to you, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, as the sort of title suggests, I'm going to sort of. Uh, be talking quite a bit about David Gross's work, but I also will sort of uh, try to tie this in to uh, proofs about quantum triviality, which is a sort of different topic um, that also sort of uh, is, is connected to this. Um, to get started, let me sort of remind you about sort of this famous plot of the running coupling constant um, that appeared in the CERN career in uh, November 2004. So this is a plot where uh, we have alpha s, the coupling constant, on the vertical axis, and the center of mass energy on the horizontal axis. And what you should be seeing is that um, we have these data points from different experiments, and we have a curve, this red curve here, which is a theory calculation, QCD, to next to next to leading order. And uh, the point being that uh, these sort of data and the theory sort of agree nicely. So basically, um, this uh, provides basically our understanding or experimental sort of evidence for our understanding that the QCD coupling constant decreases as a function of energy. Um, a simple consequence of this is that the so-called beta function, which is the derivative of the coupling with respect to the energy scale, is smaller than zero. Well, that's obvious because, well, we have a falling function, so the derivative is negative. Um, these, uh, properties, in particular, the negative beta function and the sort of uh, decrease of the coupling constant for uh, high energy implies a property known as asymptotic freedom. In the very high energy limit, so to the very right of this plot here, the coupling constant essentially goes to zero, so asymptotically uh, small. And uh, this implies that the uh, sort of building blocks um, that appear in the sort of uh, QCD Lagrangian, which are quarks and gluons, um, become non-interacting at very, very high energy, so they, they become asymptotically free. Um, the uh, finding of asymptotic freedom um, was uh, cited in the mention for the Nobel Prize in 2004 that uh, David Gross, uh, David Politzer, and Frank Bitschek shared to equal parts um, about 20 years ago. Um, also, David, um, together with Sidney Coleman, um, showed that um, the fact that this happened for QCD, so basically a theory with non-abelian uh, interactions, um, was not a coincidence. And in particular, they sort of have this uh, sort of paper out in 1973 entitled The Price of Asymptotic Freedom, where they sort of say that in the last phase here, no renormalizable field theory without non-abelian gauge fields can be asymptotically free. So that means that we have a scalar field theory cannot be asymptotically free. If you have a fermionic theory, cannot be asymptotically free. If you have a U1 gauge theory, cannot be asymptotically free. The only asymptotically free theories um, must involve non-abelian gauge fields. So let's take that as a given for now, and let's change topic uh, to something that, at first glance, would seem completely unrelated, which is the notion of quantum triviality. What is quantum triviality? Well, if you go and Google quantum triviality, then uh, there's this Wikipedia page uh, that comes up. And uh, essentially what quantum triviality uh, is uh, described there to mean is that um, in a continuum scalar field theory, for instance, if you include renormalizations, the only consistent way to set up the theory um, is such that the uh, renormalized coupling at your sort of uh, scale that you're interested in has to go to zero. Okay, so it, it must be essentially a free theory. That's the only way that you sort of set up uh, the quantum theory. And that's what quantum triviality means. Only trivial scalar field theories can exist in the continuum. 
Is there a question? Uh, no, I don't. So. Okay, um, so the, uh, in principle, that is sort of um, seems to be very sort of abstract and mathematical. Uh, however, um, I, I want to sort of just uh, point out that this is of relevance to physics because we do seem to have a scalar field in the uh, sort of uh, uh, description of the standard model of of, uh, of the universe, and that is of course the Higgs model, the Higgs uh, field, which is a two-component complex scalar field. So it has four scalar field components. And that is basically one of the sort of fields that uh, people think about when they talk about quantum triviality. Since this notion is important to my talk, I want to explain uh, the notion of quantum triviality very briefly in my own sort of uh, way. So um, the, the statement is that quantum triviality means that the running coupling at some scale m that we're interested in, let's say the mass of some particle, is zero in the continuum limit. Now, um, if you were to sort of uh, try to sort of, let's say, simulate a theory like this, um, maybe with a lattice gauge theory or lattice sphere theory or, or some other sort of theory with a cutoff, um, then once you renormalize the field theory, the running coupling would kind of look like this. Okay, so this is a plot of the running coupling, this is the black curve here, and you fixed your um, sort of uh, lattice field theory such that um, you have to sort of dial in a number when you start your simulation. And I call this lamb this value lambda naught. That's the uh, thing that you that you dial into your simulation. And um, the way this works out um, for the lattice field theory simulation is that this lambda naught is the lambda at a given scale, namely at the UV scale. Or if you run it as a lattice field theory, that would be the um, lattice scale, um, so the sort of uh, inverse uh, size of your lattice spacing. So you set up your simulation, and that's the running coupling constant. Um, that you sort of uh, uh, find from um, basically the sort of field theory description as a function of energy, I should have said this. So now that uh, you have this, um, you want to say that, okay, great, um, but uh, I'm not interested in the theory with a fixed cutoff. I don't want to sort of know what the running coupling is with a finite lattice spacing. I want to sort of take the lattice spacing to zero, or I want to take the continuum limit, in which case I have to push this lambda uv uh, far out um, towards higher energy. Um, oh, I forgot to say, um, so this is the running coupling, but of course we're interested in the running coupling at some scale, let's say m squared, the uh, mass of the particle that we're interested in, and that's the value that we actually care about, okay? So now let's sort of do what I just said. Let's push the uh, ultraviolet uh, scale to higher values uh, of energies. So if we do this, um, we sort of run our same simulation, so we sort of set a coupling constant in our lattice field theory, and instead of run it with a smaller lattice spacing, so basically a higher uh, UV cutoff, this pushes this curve to the right. But since the beta function is still the same, uh, sort of the new running coupling is sort of this uh, fat black curve now um, that you sort of get for the coupling constant um, below your ultraviolet scale. And of course, um, the scale that you're interested in is still the scale of this uh, massive particle. And now you're going to read off your new value of your coupling constant, and you're going to find a value that's smaller than the value that you had with this sort of other UV cutoff. Okay, so basically your uh, effective value of the coupling goes from here to there when you push to higher values of um, the ultraviolet cutoff. Um, and the point being that, okay, if you repeat this process, so you basically want to uh, go to the continuum limit, meaning that you want to push lambda UV to infinity, then this curve basically goes down, 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 and the corresponding value at your scale you're interested in also sort of goes down. And the only way that you can make this work with a coupling constant that has a positive beta function is if the coupling in the continuum limit goes down to zero. So this is what um, quantum triviality means. When you push your UV cutoff to infinity, the corresponding running coupling has to go to zero at your scale that you're interested in, if the beta function is positive. This is quantum triviality, and uh, this has this notion has been around for a long time. There are many people who have worked on this. Uh, in particular, I want to highlight um, a proof, mathematical proof, of quantum triviality in four dimensions uh, by these two mathematicians, Michael Eisenman and Hugo de Menil Copin, who basically sort of were able to prove this property uh, non perturbatively by mapping um, sort of scalar field theory to the Easing model 
and then using properties of statistical mechanics uh, theorems for the easy model to show that you could only sort of get a, a, a sort of quantum trivial behavior. Um, this proof of quantum triviality was cited as one reason for the Fields Medal that was awarded to Hugo de Menil Coupin in uh, 2022. And um, here's sort of the uh, uh, abstract of that uh, paper, that, that proof. It's called uh, Marginal Triviality of the Scaling Limits of Critical 4D and Ising 5.4 Models. And uh, the sort of uh, explanation is in here. I found it slightly more interesting to sort of look at um, Hugo de Miller's web page where he sort of describes um, the uh, sort of uh, essence of this proof as follows. Um, it's kind of hard to read, so I'll read it to you. Our main result from the perspective of Euclidean field theory is the triviality of Gaussian or Gaussianity of Euclidean field theories obtained as the limit of critical and near critical easing and phi 4 models in dimension 4, which corresponds to Minkowski space time. And uh, they sort of go on and say that um, this provides a complete answer that there is no way of constructing a non-trivial quantum field theory in dimension 4, starting from a 5-4 model. So basically it says that, okay, the only continuum field theory that you have with uh, scalars in a 5-4 interaction is if the scalars become trivial in the continuum. So in principle, you would say, okay, case closed. Um, Let's move on. Uh, there, there's nothing to, to get there. Paul, I have a related question. Maybe yes. Also, this may be a little unrelated to this. So, uh, is there some non perturbative way of understanding this uh, non trivial epsilon? What is uh, Wilson Peter? The Gimreg gives non perturbative way. So, you're asking uh, uh, about the non perturbativeness of Wilson Fisher? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, my understanding is that that's not really non-perturbative. I mean, all it is is to sort of you do a one-loop perturbative calculation, um, but you sort of stay away from exactly four dimensions. So you stay in, for instance, four minus two epsilon, um, and then what you have is you have a small window uh, between zero and epsilon where you do have a negative beta function. So you can define your theory in that window, but that window shrinks as you sort of go to epsilon is zero. I, 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 okay. So basically, as far as I, I understand, I mean, Wilson Fisher has been around for decades, and it's uh, sort of, um, it, it can be used as a sort of a, a motivation to sort of talk about um, quantum triviality in four dimensions proper. But really, the only proof for four dimensional quantum triviality is the proof um, that I just sort of uh, introduced here. Um, everything else is either perturbative or sort of at least um, sort of. Uh, M not not complete in some sense. Okay, so so none of them sort of uh, uh, sort of engineered or sort of were able to show uh, rigorously quantum triviality in four dimensions. F um, four plus a, a little bit, like a little bit above four dimensions, yes, but not in four minus, uh, not in in four dimensions proper. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. The, then okay. another question I have, maybe uh, again, uh, uh, maybe it has to do with this. A very not probably a little naive question. So, uh, if you, I mean, uh, the kind of proof that you are saying, or the way we understand, is exactly like you said that uh, uh, because the coupling, if the coupling has to be finite at lambda goes to infinity, it has to be zero at. I mean, there's no way to vanish. That's uh, roughly the idea of quantum triviality. But when yes. you, when you are thinking of this uh, uh, lattice setup, right? Uh, the lattice. Yes. Not sure uh, if it you can take a continuum limit because you can probably only go to some inf residual UV then uh, sorry in infrared you might get some field theory like description but it uh, but uh, this lattice model uh, how, how to go about and understand uh, is a connection with these two this, this intuitive proof that we have from calculating the beta function be very distinct from the proof that these mathematicians are giving uh, to show the triviality of like yes it's distinct um and. Okay, so in principle, okay, if you were able to calculate the beta function of scalar 5 4 theory in four dimensions, and you sort of uh, can show non perturbatively that the beta function is always positive, um, you would have this sort of property and this sort of argument that I had here applies. The problem is that for this, you have to have uh, control over the beta function in the regime where the coupling is large. 
which you cannot access by construction using perturbation theory. So there's no way that you can use perturbative uh, calculations of the beta function to show quantum triviality, because once sort of the coupling gets large, it's interesting, your calculation breaks down. Okay, so you can't use it. So it, that's why sort of this proof of uh, the uh, sort of uh, map to the easing model is important because it doesn't do anything with beta functions. It just maps it to easing and then uses statistical properties and theorems of easing, um, which are unrelated to perturbative beta functions. Yeah, yeah. So I want to my basic what I said is not there is not using some non perturbative non standard beta function either. No, 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 not that I know. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So, um, okay. So that, that that's the state uh, that the field is in. Um, what I want to sort of do is I want to poke at these proofs. And in particular, the uh, point of my seminar today is that I want to give you um, a notion that there's a loophole in these proofs of uh, asymptotic freedom and quantum triviality. And in particular, there's the same loophole in both proofs. Now, what is this loophole? Um, I have sort of uh, copied out the corresponding paragraphs in the proofs by Coleman and Gross and uh, Eisenman and Duminil Coupin. I think it's, it's hard to read, but in a nutshell, the sort of loophole is that they both assume that the coupling constant at the lattice scale, at the cutoff scale, is positive, okay? Which seems like a perfectly sort of innocuous assumption, okay? There's this assume that the coupling constant is positive, and that's sort of clearly stated in both of these proofs. And that's what these proofs really sort of uh, do, is that under these assumptions, you cannot have asymptotic freedom, and you do get quantum triviality for scalar field theories. Now, what does that mean? Well, I mean, that, that's sort of, uh, basically saying that classically we can think of a potential with a positive coupling constant as like this uh, belly shaped sort of thing here okay here on the left hand side um so if you have a classical ball rolling around in this potential uh, a potential that is uh, sort of this right right side up is uh, bounded so that means that this uh, system has classical energy levels and we sort of know how to quantize this and that's basically the story uh, for most of physics in the last 50 years. By contrast, if you sort of do something under quotes crazy, uh, you flip the coupling constant around such that it's negative, then you get an upside down potential. So it kind of looks like this. Uh, classically, if you put a ball here somewhere, then it'll sort of roll down the sort of mountain and it'll never come back. And classically, this uh, upside down potential does not have stable energy levels. Um, uh, classically, sort of, it, it doesn't make sense to think about this as a sort of well-defined uh, sort of Hamiltonian system. So our sort of standard Hamiltonian uh, quantization uh, doesn't work for this kind of potentials. So the question that I want to address is: Is it possible to have a free theory with negative coupling constant? Well, I just argued that not in classical physics. We're not interested in classical physics. We are, we are interested in quantum field theory. And in particular, um, there are some cases where um, in quantum mechanics, our classical intuition is not the best guide. And I want to sort of take this notion and sort of maybe suggest that classically unstable potentials can potentially make sense when you think about them in a quantum theory and quantum field theory context. To show what's going on, I want to sort of demonstrate the mathematics behind this, okay? The easiest way to uh, do this is to consider toy model field theories where I can actually solve everything and actually understand what's going on. This toy model field theory that I want to play with is essentially zero dimensional field theory. So it's a partition function as a function of lambda, which is given as a single integral over the x, e to the minus lambda x to the four. And the question that I want to address is, what is z evaluated at minus 1? Okay. So clearly, if you sort of plug in minus 1 to this uh, integral representation, you get nonsense very much the, along the same lines as what uh, Sidney Coleman and David Gross wrote in their proof of the asymptotic freedom back in 1973. 
a completely unrelated or seemingly unrelated function um, is this function here, zeta of s, which uh, has a representation sum from n is 1 to infinity of 1 uh, n to the s. And we can also ask the question, what is uh, zeta of minus 1 here? And if we plug it into this sort of uh, representation, this sum representation here, you would be asking uh, to calculate the value of the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on and so forth. And of course, we know how to do this. Um, this function is called the Riemann zeta function for the very reason that Riemann in 1859 showed that it possesses an analytic continuation given by this sort of formula over here that lets you access um, zeta in the sort of complex domain, so complex arguments. And in particular, it also lets you access zeta for negative um, real numbers. How does this work? Well, here on the right hand side, we have uh, something where if you want to evaluate zeta of minus one, then we can sort of uh, plug in to the right hand side here. It maps it to zeta of two and gamma of two and some other sort of things. And then what we find is that zeta of minus one is uniquely defined to be minus one twelfth. Okay. So it's not infinity, it's not not defined, it is a calculable finite value that's negative. How can this be possible? Well, this sum risk representation is sum representation only for the uh, domain of argument S that has a positive real number, but uh, it is possible to give different representations of this uh, function, zeta of S, that lets you access negative arguments. And that's why the Riemann zeta function is called Riemann zeta function and not Euler, not Euler zeta function. Um, even if you sort of believe that this is voodoo uh, and, and something like this, let me sort of uh, try to sort of tell you that it doesn't matter whether you believe or don't believe this, you can actually measure it, okay? Um, the zeta function is a function that crops up in an effect called the Casimir effect. What is this? It's if you sort of take the electromagnetic field uh, between two plates, and in quantum field theory, um, the fact that you have boundary conditions on these plates here um, sort of uh, makes these sort of... Um, uh, introduces a force between these two plates, and the force between these two plates is exactly zeta of negative argument. And you can measure this, um, slightly different configuration, here it's a plate and a sphere, and the sort of uh, z zeta function, negative argument, gives you this uh, line, that black line in this, in this graph here for the force, the Casimir force, and these sort of dots here are the experimental values, okay? So it doesn't matter what you believe, but this is real, okay? You can measure it, um, and zeta of negative argument is a well-defined function, and it is given by Riemann's uh, analytic continuation. So now let's sort of take this knowledge and apply it to our toy model field theory. One way to get this is to sort of say that, oh, wait a moment, this integral here for positive lambda, I can evaluate this, okay? So I do a variable change, x goes to x uh, times lambda to the minus uh, one quarter, and then you get a number for this integral so that z of lambda for positive lambda, positive real part of lambda, uh, becomes uh, this result here, twice lambda to the minus one quarter times the gamma of five fourths. Once you have this result, we know how to analytically continue a root function. Okay? And if we do this, then uh, we sort of find that um, one particular sort of analytic continuation of this is given as, as this value here, where we just have taken the quarter root of minus one, and we sort of get this result for the um, value for z of minus one. There's a different way of sort of doing this. Maybe I should have said this. Um, so at this point here, when we sort of do the analytic continuation of the root function, the fact that we have a quarter root means that the um, analytic continuation to negative uh, values of lambda is not unique, okay? So in particular for the quarter root, you have four uh, Riemann sheets that you can up end up on. And uh, that means that in principle, you don't know which ones of the ones is the right one or which combination is one. Uh, you need additional information and I'll be sort of uh, reviewing how you can get this additional information to get a unique analytic continuation. Before I do so, however, let me sort of show you a different way of getting to the analytic, uh, analytically continued value for negative uh, values of the coupling constant. Uh, this is the integral representation 
for positive real part, as we've discussed. But I could sort of uh, try to make sense of this function for negative coupling by deforming this integration contour. Okay, so this is an integration contour along the real axis, but uh, I could sort of bend it into the complex domain, some contour C, such that an integral of this form here is now well defined. So if you do that, and I'll show you the contour uh, that I'm using in a second, um, you find a sort of uh, result that um, sort of matches the, uh, uh, so this should be option one, it matches sort of the option one where we sort of calculated for lambda is bigger than zero, and then sort of do the analytic continuation of the uh, sort of quarter root here. So um, if you sort of did this route with the uh, sort of contour deformation, you find that you can evaluate this uh, integral on this complex contour and you get a result that looks like this. And this basically matches your result for the um, first option that we talked about. I mentioned uh, the analytic continuation by itself is not unique because there are different branches of the root. However, we can make the analytic continuation unique if there is additional information. One particular additional information that we could use is to sort of say that, oh, we want the partition function to be real and positive. If we add this additional information, then there's a unique analytic continuation to negative coupling, and it's given by this value here. Okay? And the whole point that I wanted to sort of stress is that for things that look like toy field theories, the result at negative coupling is no more nonsense than evaluating the Riemann zeta function at negative coupling, and we can measure this quantity. If you said, okay, that was too mathematical, maybe sort of, I, I, I don't want to sort of do, uh, don't want to believe in the math. I want to sort of have a different argument of why it is that negative, uh, classically unstable potentials um, could basically sort of uh, lead to well-defined quantum theories. Let me sort of give you a different argument that has to do with symmetry. I already said that in uh, standard quantum mechanics, um, we sort of have uh, positive, um, uh, unbounded potentials, and in particular, we sort of uh, entertain this notion that observables must be Hermitian, meaning that in particular, the Hermitian conjugate of the Hamiltonian must be equal to the Hamiltonian itself. So we know, we have proof, that hermeticity is sufficient for real and positive um, eigenspectra, in particular, a real and positive ground state. The thing that I want to sort of uh, point out is that it could be that it's sufficient but maybe not necessary to have a real and positive ground state. And in fact, this has so, been... Uh, sorry, uh, can I interrupt? Yes, so, uh, please. Sorry, what is this uh, proof that uh, the ground state must have positive energy? Well, uh, yes. Okay, sorry. I'm, we can just take a diagonal matrix with which yes. is neg with the negative entries. Yes, I, I guess I guess you're right that uh, it probably just uh, sort of says that it's real and bounded. It's not necessarily oh, part. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, so the sort of uh, study of uh, sort of classically unstable or non-Hermitian Hamiltonians was really sort of opened up in this uh, benchmark paper, or sort of very um, influential paper by uh, Bender and Böttcher in 1997, where they studied Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics that were of this form here. Okay. So the potential here was minus i x to the power n, where they sort of evaluated this for different values of n. And if you look at this potential, it's immediately clear that this is not emission. Okay, it has an i in there, and there's a minus, and this is clearly not emission. Um, but what they were able to show is that, uh, well, not only show they could calculate the energy levels for this uh, uh, particular Hamiltonian as a function of n. So here they are. In particular for our case, n is four, where we have this negative x to the four potential. This is the ground state energy. This is the first excited state. This is the second excited state, third excited state. And um, later on, it was shown that uh, basically all the sort of spectrum for the uh, minus x to the four potential, uh, all the energies are real, and in this case, also positive. Again, you could say that, okay, this is voodoo mathematics, and we don't believe that. Well, you can actually do experiments. 
In particular, you can do classical uh, electrodynamics in a medium, a complex media where the uh, refractive index is uh, complex. So n is, has a real and an imaginary part. And because it has a real and an imaginary part, it kind of looks like a non-Hamitian sort of uh, Hamiltonian. And you can sort of probe um, or experimental sort of properties, such as the loss of this sort of uh, cavity as a function of the width of the strip that they're sort of having. And the uh, sort of uh, calculation, um, this non hermitian sort of calculation is the sort of this blue line here. And the experiments uh, find these sort of dots over there. And you could say, okay, there's some discrepancy between simulation and experiment, but overall sort of the fact that uh, there is a sort of measurable sort of uh, quantity at all that sort of gives something meaningful for these non-hermitian uh, sort of uh, systems, um, I think is, is, is very strongly in favor that um, the sort of hermeticity requirement that we usually do in quantum mechanics is too strong of a demand and we can do with less symmetry than that. So I think um, there is very good evidence um, in low dimensional systems that negative coupling theories are not nonsense, okay? They may be classically nonsense, but from a quantum mechanics perspective, we can use analytic continuation and they are basically perfectly well-defined. We can do experiments. These systems exist. They're well-defined as analytic continuations. The analytic continuation is unique if you have additional information. I didn't mention this. Um, in this sort of study for this quantum mechanic non hermitian um, sort of energy levels, um, these uh, Hamiltonians do have a symmetry. It's not hermeticity, it's only symmetry under parity and time reversal transformations, or PT symmetry for short. And PT symmetry is sufficient to give you real and positive eigenspectrum. It could still be that um, these theories are pathological for other reasons. Okay. If you calculate observable, it comes out, I don't know, something. Um, it could be that the theory has to be dismissed because of this. But the fact that you, you have a negative coupling constant by its own is not sufficient reason to just say that, oh, these don't make any sense. Uh, Paul, can I ask something really uh, yes. basic? Uh, so if you do not have a Hermitian Hamiltonian, is the time yes. evolution theory? Yes, you do get unitary time evolution if you have PT symmetry. I see. So all, all, all the sort of usual uh, requirements on observables in quantum mechanics do go through. I see. So you have prob well-defined probabilities and... Uh, well-defined probability, positivity, unitarity, all of these things, yes. So the S matrix is also unitary, then you can define... Yes, it. yes. So my proposal is uh, to say that, okay, great. Um, let's just not sort of dismiss these theories because, uh, but just let's sit down, calculate observables and see whether these theories actually make any sense. Um, I sort of argued that for quantum mechanics, we have even experimental evidence that that's the case. But what I wanna do is I wanna introduce this notion um, of negative coupling P theories to actual four dimensions, okay? Because I'm gonna talk about negative coupling and maybe very large coupling, I cannot use a perturbative framework, okay? It will not work because whenever sort of things get interesting, um, I will have to say that, oh, I can't really trust my calculation. For these reasons, I need a non-perturbative uh, field theory. Uh, can, I need a field theory that can I solve non-perturbatively. And that's why I wanna introduce uh, or remind you of the properties of this model, the ON model, okay? What is the ON model? It's basically just a, a model with scalars, phi. There's just N of them, okay? And then uh, the partition function is sort of defined in a usual way, but you have a Euclidean action and a sort of throw in a phi to the four term in this action. Now you might say that that's a very sort of contrived model where, the, where this, this actual stuff come from. It turns out that there are several examples in physics where this model is important. Um, in quantum mechanics, um, this is regular bosonic quantum mechanics in n dimensions. Okay, so if you write down the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions and you write it as a path integral, this is the theory that you get where n is the number of dimensions. 
In two plus one dimensions, this theory has uh, been conjectured to have a gravity dual in the limit for n to infinity. Um, the gravity dual is conjectured to be higher spin gravity, also known as Vasiliev gravity in ADS4, asymptotic ADS4. And, uh, and there's a lot of work on, on that um, particular field theory um, in that context. In three plus one dimension, I already mentioned at the beginning of this seminar, um, the case N is four, so four real fields, a, a two component complex field, that is nothing else but the standard model Higgs field. So um, this theory sort of is also relevant uh, because of this. So it's not sort of a completely contrived model, it sort of has uh, specific realizations in nature that we care about. The nice thing about the ON model is that it's exactly solvable as an interacting fee theory in the limit where n is very, very large. And this has been known for decades. Uh, there's a nice review by Moshe and Saint-Justin. You can take my sort of more modern take on this uh, by looking at my lecture notes from the school in Zakopane that I gave um, this uh, past month, which are on the archive. Um, so this is a full non-perturbative calculation because you never expand in the small coupling. You can use 1 over n to be a small coupling parameter. So this is not a weak coupling framework. Nevertheless, you might be worried that, okay, maybe this large n thing that you're doing um, is actually sort of uh, irrelevant for n on the order of a few, um, which is what I want to sort of get at at the end of the day. To make tests of uh, the method, um, I have to compare with uh, results by some other non-perturbative method, and um, in four dimensions, there's very little to go at. So for this reason, I'm going to present to you quantitative tests of this large n method in dimensions less than four. In particular, in two plus one dimensions, um, the theory is super normalizable, and you can do uh, lattice free theory calculations for this. You can do numerical bootstrap calculations for this. Um, so there's a lot of non-perturbative uh, solution techniques that you can use for this kind of free theory. What I want to show to you is results for the critical exponent delta phi for this three-dimensional ON model for various values of n. Okay. So what's shown here is this. Uh, critical exponent, delta phi, on this uh, vertical axis, as a function of 1 over n, where n is the number of components. So if n is 1, n is 2, n is 3, and so on and so forth. And then we have the large n results. The leading large n order is this black line down here. Then we have the next to leading order, next to next to leading order, and n3 LO. And the point to take away from this is that um, these large n results, even the leading large n result, are not crazy, okay? They're not completely off. I mean, if you look at the scale here, even the leading large end result is, what, less than 5% away from the sort of uh, numerical uh, value you get from the bootstrap. And this gets better as you sort of go to higher orders in large end expansion. So you do get um, sort of quantitatively reliable results from the large end expansion down to values of n of a few, maybe even down to n of four. You can also sort of say that, okay, great. I mean, you just recover results from other uh, sort of uh, calculations. So I want to also point out that these large N models allow you to do things that are extremely hard to do with other approaches. So I want to talk about uh, results for uh, finer temperatures, so thermodynamics and uh, near equilibrium transport properties. For instance, you can calculate the entropy density in this model. And you can calculate it not only in the weak coupling or strong coupling limit, you can calculate it for all values of the coupling. And this is a plot of the result, entropy density scaled by the free entropy density, SOS3, as a function of this coupling compactified in this sort of form here, such that vanishing couplings of free theory is here to the left, and infinite coupling is here at one. And what you see is that the result sort of is this uh, monotonically decreasing function that smoothly goes from 1 to this value of uh, 0 0.8, which you can prove to be exactly 4 over 5. Okay? So you can calculate the theory in the infinite coupling limit, and you get this ratio of 4 over 5, which to some people is very reminiscent of the corresponding ratio of 3 quarters that you find for n equals 4 super mills in four dimensions. You can go beyond this result yes. is uh, is is uh, exact in uh, in n yes large and exact yes 
Okay. Thank yes. you. You can go beyond and you can say that, okay, if thermodynamics is really easy, we have so many methods to calculate thermodynamics, calculate something interesting for us. Um, out of equilibrium properties are hard to calculate. So here is a, a quantity that is an out of equilibrium property, near equilibrium, the shear viscosity coefficient in this ON model, again, for all values of the coupling in the leading large end limit, lambda zero over here, the shear viscosity over entropy ratio is very large for small values of the coupling that sort of uh, matches perturbative wisdom. And then at infinite coupling, this quantity sort of bends over and uh, becomes a finite value about 0 0.42 or something like this in these units. Um, and again, that is uh, not unexpected. We expect this value to go to some finite value. Uh, however, um, the sort of value that you get out here um, sort of is, is calculable within the field theory and uh, it kind of qualitatively matches what we expect from things like N equals 4 super emails um, through the gauge gravity uh, conjecture where we get uh, E to S is 1 over 4 pi basically. So again, you can calculate this. This is large and exact and it is there for all values of the coupling. So you can use these large N sort of techniques to calculate interesting properties. Sorry, just as a curiosity, isn't yes. the ADS4, uh, are there ADS4 results for this particular part? Uh, no, there the, uh, yes, no, there are no ADS4 results for finite temperature physics. And the reason is that Vasiliev gravity doesn't have a known action. Um, so you can't actually calculate E to S for this case. You can calculate it for ADS4 proper, but not for higher spin gravity, which is the dual, conjecture dual to this theory. It would be great if somebody wasn't to do that, but yeah. yeah. The thing is that I think that what you are saying is that uh, we can't construct a black hole as a particular solution of some equations. That's is that that's because we don't know the action. But for the dissipation yes. coefficient, you only need the fluctuations around the background. Yes, but you have all this higher spin field, so I'm not sure what I, I have. Oh, well, so okay, if you know how to do this, I think this would be fantastic. Um, but I, I have okay. there's, there's no result in the literature that, that claims to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, but um, just to sort of reiterate, I just wanted to sort of use this as a motivation to say that, okay, in less than four dimensions, the large N method, the math is rock solid, okay? There's, there's no discussion it. We can compare it to anything we want to. We always sort of get uh, good results. Uh, the large N sort of expansions seem to be actually quantitatively reliable to any of the order of a few. And we can discuss whether a few is 10 or whether it's five or whether it's maybe one. Um, and you can use these large N results to calculate things like thermodynamics, transport. You can actually calculate anything you want for scalars in less than four dimensions for all values of the coupling. Okay. Now, once we have that, why don't we assume, well, why don't we sort of apply this machinery which works so well in less than four dimensions to four dimensions and just trust the math, okay? That's all I'm doing. I'm, I'm just not using any intuition whatsoever. I'm just doing the math as I do in low dimensions and I'm just gonna look at what's coming out and I'm gonna calculate observables and then let's see what it, wanted, what it wants to tell me. So if you do that, um, the one thing that changes when you go from less than four dimensions to four dimensions is that in four dimensions, you have to renormalize the theory. It's a non-renormalizable, non-perturbative renormalization uh, because you're doing non-perturbative physics. You can take the continuum limit of this uh, procedure and you find the continuum running coupling uh, constant at large n, which is given in this formula here. Okay? The first thing you should notice is that this coupling is not zero. Okay? So this theory is uh, not quantum trivial, even though you took the, con the continuum limit and these are scalars, which seems to directly contradict the mathematical proof that I spent the first 10 or 15 minutes of my seminar uh, explaining. How is this possible? Well, you look at this function here and you realize that at high energy, so close to your cutoff, if you had one, then the sort of mu is larger than lambda ms bar, the sort of logarithm is negative. And so you find that this theory, when you solve it without knowing or having any intuition about what it's doing, 
it says that the running coupling constant approaches zero, but it approaches zero from below in the ultraviolet. So the theory in sort of RG speak has a UV fixed point, but the bare coupling is negative. This is a plot of the exact large end running coupling in the ON model. For a small value of the energy scale, you have this positive beta function that sort of does this. But then there's a non-analytic behavior right at this scale here. And the coupling continu continues to increase, but you're sort of, uh, you have analytically continued to sort of a different um, sort of domain here. And then you find that the coupling constant continues to increase, but it's now negative and it approaches zero from below. That's what the math is telling. The beta function is always positive. You can calculate it. But because of this non-analytic behavior, the running coupling decreases for high energy. Okay? I told you that it, it approaches zero from below. But what does that mean? It means that the theory becomes asymptotically free for high energies in scalar field theory, which directly contradicts the proof by Gross and uh, Coleman. And again, the trick to avoid the uh, sort of uh, proof that they sort of gave the loophole, if you want so, is again the same thing. The coupling constant approaches zero from below, which was explicitly sort of uh, dismissed in the proof by Coleman and uh, Gross by saying that, okay, this makes no sense classically, we're gonna dismiss this possibility entirely. So it exploits the same, the proof or uh, the loophole in the asymptotic freedom proof exploits the same loophole as the one for the quantum two reality proof. Uh, maybe this, uh, maybe I can ask this question. Maybe that would be yes. Uh, so this statistical mechanics system, uh, is there any analog of uh, making in the statistical model this lambda negative? And because you said that's the central assumption of this proof. Yes. Well, um, so, so, okay. I think this is precisely the, the sort of key point that we are trying to answer at this point. You, well, if you, I don't think I have, I have a slide in this, so I'll, I'll just explain it now. So if you were to sort of say that, okay, great, let's try to check this. Let's put negative coupling field theory on the lattice and calculate what's going on. The first thing that you notice that you can't use the usual integral representation of the partition function because it's not sort of defined for negative coupling. You have to quantize on these deformed contours, and we know how to do that. And if you do this, what you end up with is a lattice field theory, which you can sort of uh, evaluate for a given number of sites or given uh, lattice spacing. But the problem is that A, the action that you get is not real, has a sign problem. Okay? So the partition function is real, but the, the action is not. And so B. Uh, I mean, wouldn't the action be complex actually for general yes. contours? Yes, it's complex. Yes, yeah, it's complex action. Um, and maybe even worse than that, it does not seem to have a polynomial continuum expression. You can write it down as a lattice expression, but it doesn't seem to have a polynomial form when you want to take the lattice space into zero. So, so I, I guess that's maybe one way of sort of putting it that the reason that people haven't figured this out before is that they would have had to simulate non-polynomial or study non-polynomial actions, which in physics we typically do not do, okay? Uh, we sort of limit ourselves to uh, systems that have polynomial actions where you can write down like a Lagrangian in closed form and things like this. It could be that there's these systems out there that just do not have a polynomial Lagrangian, but they're perfectly well-defined theories. And it kind of looks like that this yeah. is what these negative coupling field theories turn into when you quantize them on the corresponding contours. Thanks, Paul. Uh, but uh, really, so somehow here, large n is something that is a very crucial technique, and so it's planning to see this, to, to make this discovery. Isn't uh, somehow, uh, can we see it also directly in the, the way the large n could help in, together with the lack of so, so I, I think I, I missed part of what you asked. So you say that large n is, uh, is, is one thing, but you want to sort of have at least something that is starting at finite n, and you want to sort of use more pedestrian ways to sort of discover that. Is, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, sort of. But uh, somehow to take the limit, uh, like take the large n limit before you take the continuum limit in a way. 
well, um, so the, the way these things are done is that um, you sort of have n is large, but you do sort of take the continuum limit first. So it, it, you have well, the, the large end you basically sort of use to sort of, uh, uh, so sort of limit yourself to uh, certain contributions to your saddle um, that um, are not one of n suppressed, um, but you basically sort of always take the continuum limit before you sort of take the large end. I see. Yeah. So this but um, yes. Non-negotiable ordering, I see. I, 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 yes, I guess so. Um, yes. I mean, the, the thing is, of course, that um, people have uh, sort of thought about sort of uh, scalar fee theory with negative coupling um, for n is one or two. Uh, of course, there you can't use a large n technique. So what people have done is they used a, a randomization group and perturbation theory, and they basically find things that are very similar to the ones that I have been presenting here, with the key difference that whenever things get interesting, because they use perturbation theory, their method breaks down. So that's really what's different in the large N. In large N, it's inherently non-perturbative, um, and you can actually push this through and get the complete large N, the next to leading order large N, and so on and so forth, um, and, and you have control over the sort of uh, large negative coupling region because of the large N parameter. Okay, um, in my last few minutes, I wanted to sort of uh, quickly sort of show you some further results that you get from this. Okay, so you could sort of say, that, okay, great, uh, that's a mathematical curiosity and we don't really have to care about this. I want to convince you that this is interesting and it could be really be a big deal um, if you take this seriously and if we sort of uh, spend a little bit more effort in exploring these kinds of theories. To do this, I want to remind you of the following uh, property. In the standard model, we have uh, the Higgs field, and the standard model Higgs potential has two parameters. Okay? It has the coupling constant, lambda, and it has this minus m squared, this tachyonic mass term, which um, basically sort of gives rise to this uh, symmetry breaking mechanism. In the ORM model, um, the sort of uh, potential has only one parameter, the running coupling, but of course there are radiative corrections. Now there are also radiative corrections in the Higgs model, but you already have two parameters there, so the radiative corrections, all they do is they modify this and they modify that, but they don't sort of add a new term. So let's now look at what the radiative corrections, or the, what the effective potential in the ON model to leading large N looks like if you only have one parameter and we include the radiative corrections. The effective potential looks like this. Okay. So the radiative correction sort of bring down the potential such that it has a minimum at a non-vanishing value of the uh, field squared, phi squared. So the radiative corrections generate a vacuum expectation value for the field. This is the stable uh, minimum of the field theory, and it, it does that without ever having to add a tachyonic master. It also says that the perturbative minimum, which is this one here, that's where the standard model calculations live, that this minimum is unstable with respect to the true minimum, the number derivative minimum, which is out here. Now, this statement that the perturbative minimum of the Higgs field is unstable, then actually agrees with the consensus in electron weak uh, phenomenology. Okay, so you can look at uh, papers in there, and they have statements like there's a 95% probability that the perturbative vacuum for the Higgs sector is unstable. To drive home the point, this is the standard model Lagrangian in all its gory detail. These pieces here, those are the Higgs sectors. Okay, here's the derivative, here is the tachyonic mass term, and here is the sort of uh, quartic coupling. In the ON model, you would start with something that doesn't have the tachyonic mass term. But you get the same physics, one less parameter. So the way that I sort of see this is that 
if you can flesh this out in this full sort of gory standard model Lagrangian, and you can get the same results with one less parameter, I think this could be a competitor to the Higgs mechanism. In a sort of nutshell, what do you get? You get this symmetric mass generation, so you get a vacuum expectation value for phi squared. This is not a new sort of thing. Uh, Coleman and Weinberg noted this in the 1970s, but what they did was that they calculated the value of the Higgs, which is a prediction in this model, and they found something that was much too low. Okay, they was ruled out by experiment even then. And the reason they get this low value is that they insist on throwing away terms that they call not under perturbative control. Okay, so they do perturbation theory, and they say, oh, but this term is large, but with this, let me just throw it away. In the ORM model, you don't have to do that. Large n provides the counting parameter. You keep everything that contributes to any order in large n. Okay, so if the leading order has this term, you don't throw it out by hand. And if you don't do this, then suddenly you find that, okay, this method actually gives a Higgs that's I would say not crazy, okay? So you do, do get a mass term for the Higgs, um, and you have a prediction for the Higgs mass out of this theory in terms of the form of the running coupling. Another thing that you get is that um, you get a, a finite vacuum for energy density. You can calculate it. Here's the value, uh, which is below the perturbative vacuum. So another thing that comes out is that you basically have uh, proof that the perturbative vacuum that um, the standard model is based on is unstable with respect to decay to this non-perturbative vacuum. You could say that, okay, great, uh, maybe the uh, sort of problems with this model, the negative coupling constant, um, only shows up when you do scattering. Uh, well, the way to check this, in my opinion, is to calculate scattering amplitudes, which are observable, and see whether there are any pathologies. So this is the scattering amplitude uh, for this ON model in the large N limit. Um, it is a function that has no pathologies. It sort of is falling. And then what it does have is it has an additional stable bound state at a calculable mass, about 1.84 times the Higgs mass, that crumps up of this model. How is this possible? Well, it's possible because if you look into the calculational details, you can re-expand this large N exact but non-perturbative cross-section in perturbation theory, and then you find that, oh yes, at every order in perturbation theory, there is a problem from the negative coupling constant, but the large n sums up this whole perturbative series, and it comes up with a finite result out of this uh, summation. So that's basically the, the upshot of it. Large n is inherently non-perturbative, and the non-perturbative nature cures these perturbative problems that you would normally associate with negative coupling constants. So I mean, uh, can I ask uh, if this Please. is uh, if you re if you resum the uh, calculations of Coleman and Weinberg in a, over uh, some different analytic continuation contours, do you think we should be able to get the same results? That's precisely what my group is working on. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. And, and it's it's not okay. So in principle, so we have results for the scalar part. But you are aware that in standard model, there's not just the scalar field, okay? There is the fields, there's yeah. all the uh, quarks, there's all the lepton, and you have to have all of them, at least to one loop order, to have some idea where your sort of actual parameters sit. This is not an afternoon's calculation. So we estimate, we estimate about six months until we're done. And then okay, nice, it's nice. Okay, we get the right value of the Higgs and the right value of the cross sections and the sort of branching ratios, or we don't, okay? So it's hot or drop. We have parameter, we cannot fudge this model. Okay, it's impossible. So, <laughs> so the, we, the, the mass of the W is, a, is, is uh, are you looking at that as well? So, it, it, okay, so the, the standard model, let me sort of go back um, and I, oh, I have to really wrap up, I think. So the standard model sort of has all of these sort of things in here and it has a couple of parameters, okay? So in particular, what it does is it has the, uh, the, the Higgs uh, mass, it has the Higgs coupling, it has the fine structure constant, which is hidden here somewhere, uh, and it has the Weinberg angle. So there's four parameters. Oh, okay, 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 I see, okay. And then they get four, four numbers out of it. They get the W, the Z, 
refined structure constant and the Higgs mass. So what we have is we have one best parameter. So basically we sort of do the same thing with the other three. So we would fix the W, the Z, and the fine structure constant, I guess. But the Higgs mass would be our prediction. Right, right. Yes, I understand. Oh, yeah. right OK. Um, yes. So this, uh, so, so the, in the large in calculation, the Landau pole ap appears to be some physical uh, scale. And how is it? Is it, is it, is it, is it the same scale as the bound state mark? Or? Um, it is, um, okay, so the, yes, so uh, you are right, um, the sort of, I sort of, let me sort of quickly go back to the system running coupling, and as uh, was pointed out, there is this sort of one point where the coupling constant diverges, this uh, thing has a name, it's called the Landau pole. The Landau pole sets the scale of all dimensionful quantities in this theory, okay? So um, the Higgs mass is up to a constant of order one, the same as the Landau pole, the, um, this theory actually has uh, two phases, has a low temperature phase and a high temperature phase. The uh, Landau pole sets the critical phase transition temperature, uh, which is second order phase transition. Um, and it also sort of sets then sort of this additional sort of resonance, um, which is about twice, th this, this extra bound state, which is about twice the Higgs mass. So everything, every dimensional full quantity is set in terms of the Higgs, uh, in terms of the Landau pole. So the Landau pole is the fundamental scale of this theory. That's, that's Very much like Lambda QCD is in QCD. Yeah, so this is why I was asking, uh, this is why actually my first question was, uh, is it has some significance on the metric for uh, So you were breaking up there. Is it has some, some significance for what? Uh, well, I mean, uh, you should be able to see it from a lattice calculation. From, but you yes. said very well that, uh, I mean, it's yep. not a standard where you have to sum over complex numbers to get a real answer. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, I, I, I may have, I hope I have a, a slide in the backup to sort of uh, address this point. Um, but if I may, I will quickly summarize before that and then uh, try to address your question on how to put this theory on the lattice. Okay, let me sort of summarize. The main point that I had in my seminar here is that I believe senior management has built what can only be called a mental roadblock about scalars and four dimensions. There are proofs about asymptotic freedom and quantum triviality, and they have the same loophole that they assume positive coupling constant. However, we know from low dimensional field theories that negative coupling field theories can be made sense by analytic continuation. And in four dimensions, the explicit calculation that I showed, without sort of knowing about this sort of loophole, turns out to be exploiting precisely this property. This ON model that I have is a non-perturbative field theory which can be solved exactly in the large limit. And it provides a practical testing ground for these ideas. Obviously, this is just the start. We're just starting to sort of do calculations so there are more checks on observables in particular that are needed to sort of say that, oh yes, this theory really is a theory that has been unexplored for five decades, or there really is a problem that sort of shows up down the road. So far, I would be surprised if suddenly, at, I don't know, next to next to next to leading order in large N, a pathology develops, but I cannot sort of say more than what we have calculated so far. I believe this theory is interesting to study because in particular, it could be a potential competitor to the dielectric theory um, of the standard model, and it could be a new kind of asymptotically free theory that has just not been studied for 50 years. So I'll leave you with my sort of thank you note. Please stop using classical intuition. Just calculate the observables and check. Thank you very much. Thanks for this great seminar. Okay. Sure. Let, let, let me sort of try to answer the one question about the uh, lattice setup. And for this, let me quickly run through my backup slides and hope that I can. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, so if you're asking about putting negative coupling 5.4 on the lattice, um, this thought has occurred to me. Um, and 
the upshot is that you can do this. Um, you can do this, but because it is a theory that ends up having a non-polynomial action and a complex action, this theory has a sign problem, even on this contour. So you can calculate the integral, but because it has a sign problem, you cannot use Monte Carlo important sampling. So what that means is that you're left with trying to solve this theory by direct numerical integration. And direct numerical integration is possible for low dimensional integrals on the cluster, computer cluster that I have at my disposal, I could push this to about 30 dimensional integrals. So 30 dimensional integrals means that the number of lattice sites and correspondingly the lattice spacing that you can explore is very, very limited, okay? Um, however, as a proof of concept, this is sort of the results that you get. These are uh, lattice simulations for negative coupling phi four for two cubed times one and three cubed times one. Uh, and what's shown here is um, essentially the pressure over t to the four as a function of the log of the temperature. And what you for the expect from the OM model, this continuum OM model, is that this theory has a low temperature phase where the pressure is very small, then overshoots the Stefan Boltzmann limit and approaches the Stefan Boltzmann limit from above because of the negative coupling constant. And qualitatively on these very small lattices, um, this is what you find, okay? So these dots here are the lattice simulations and uh, they do overshoot the Stefan Boltzmann limit and they do seem to come down, but really it's just too small to make any strong statements, okay? So it's not crazy, but we very rapidly run out of steam. So now what we're doing is we're trying to sort of see to push this to larger lattice uh, simulations. Um, and really what we think we have to do is uh, try to put this on a quantum computer because that will allow us to sort of do not direct numerical integration fast for larger lattices. Um, so that's what we're currently trying to do. But uh, yeah, so we'll see whether that succeeds or not. So in principle, it's possible. This shows that it's possible but the lattices we can actually do or have results for at the moment are just too small to sort of convince you either way. So th I have a small comment here. Uh, apparently there is this method called the complex Langevin method. Yes. Which actually does work for complex actions and produces yes. good results. Yes. Have you considered that? Oh, so I, of I talked to people doing complex Langevin and they said, that, oh, this is interesting. We're going to do it, uh, but we have other things that we're doing now. So maybe next year. <laughs> okay. But if you want to beat them, please go ahead. I mean, I, 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 I so we have lots of things that we need to do. Uh, this is one sort of road that we want to follow. But yes, complex Langeva is a potential sort of other thing that you could just throw this at and let's just see what you get. Yes, I agree. Another one would be left with thimbles. Um, but, yeah, yeah. So I was going to ask about Lefschetz thimbles. So do, have you studied the thimbles in the case of uh, negative lambda? Yes, for large end, you can start, you can study the thimbles um, very easily. And you sort of, well, the large end thimbles are just the saddles that you sort of get in these, or they correspond to the saddles that you have in the positive coupling field theory. Um, and, and that's basically what you use in order to calculate or solve the large end theory is you calculate the thimbles and integrate over the thimbles. Uh, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's the whole thing. Um, it, at finite n, identifying the thimbles is much more complicated. Um, we have not really sort of even tried to do this systematically. Um, well, so I mean, you know, right? I mean, if you try to do this for like these small lattices that we have here, yeah. three cubes and one, I mean, it, it, it's an high, extremely high dimensional sort of space to look for saddles uh, and, and, and thimbles. Uh, we have not really sort of found a, a sort of convincing method to do this. There are some people trying to do uh, what's known as normalizing flows to sort of have the contour flow to these symbols automatically. So, so there are things people can do. Um, right, right. But yeah, so, yeah. Sure. so, I mean, I have a small uh, thing. From the easing side, can we not complexify the easing action itself and uh... No. Not that I know of. I, well, okay, I, I think you can, but then uh, at least from what the mathematicians sort of use, the one thing they need is they need a probabilistic uh, interpretation of the sort of uh, uh, Boltzmann factor. And once you sort of complexify the coupling, that, that you lose that, essentially. Um, 
Now you could say that, okay, I mean, in principle, um, you can sort of try to sort of do this. And I think in low dimensional sort of easing, you could potentially sort of get this to work. Um, but the problem is that you don't have an analytic understanding of, let's say, 3D easing or 4D easing. So I'm not sure whether this really helps. Okay, thanks. I have a, another paper question. Uh, yes. Uh, are there examples in like 2D CFTs or, or, or 2D systems with, with the solvable, but with the PT symmetric, but not me? Not yet. Um, we have we have a plan for putting something out at some point. Um, but yes, that, that that's basically I think the next stepping stone is that there is this whole literature on this PT symmetric quantum mechanics, which is one dimensional. There is no published result on an actual PT symmetric theory for n is one or two. We believe we can do this, um, but we're not there yet. Um, so if if you sort of basically have, have a good idea on how to sort of do this from a, a conformal fifth year method or something like this, um, I think this would be fantastic, but but so far there's nothing, okay? So, so really uh, 1D is the case where sort of the knowledge pretty much stops with PT, PT symmetric uh, theories, but we think we can do 2D. Okay, so what what would be one example that you would think about in this context? For the 2D? Just the lambda phi 2D power 4 itself would be a good uh... Yes. So um, so you're talking about the lower dimension phi theories or the four dimensional ones? Two dimensional. Yeah. So basically, yeah, lambda phi 4 theory uh, with negative lambda, basically. Um, in two dimensions. Um, and, and, and yes, so basically sort of I, our idea would be to basically transform it, well, so basically transform it into something where we can, it's like a lattice theory, but we won't use Monte Carlo for this two-dimensional one. We would use basically what Onsaga used in his sort of character expansions to solve the easing model to sort of get this working. Um, and it kind of, it's halfway there, but we are not finished yet. So, so basically, what we have in mind is, is having a lattice free theory that we can solve on like enormous lattices, like a million squared or something like this. That's essentially what we are aiming to do. Okay. <laughs> are there more questions? Not let thank uh, Paul again for this uh, very engaging today. And thank you. So thank I can open the recording. We have a fine.